Hi guys, welcome to the 3M Fear podcast and I'm here with another interesting story. This is a story of a young girl who got killed in her college library in the presence of a lot of people. She could have been saved if the right people had paid attention at the right time. This is the story of Betsy Azma. Hello and welcome to the 3 AM Fear podcast. I'm Nikita Ferrao, mystery and thriller author. On this podcast, I talk about real crimes and real people. Due to the graphic nature of some of this content, listener discretion is advised. You can find the episode show notes on my website 3amfear.com. Let's get started. Elizabeth Ruth Artsma, born as Betsy Artsma, was a 22-year-old graduate student who was brutally stabbed to death inside the Petty Library at the Pennsylvania State University between 4:30 p.m. and 4:45 p.m. with a single knife, 3 to 4 inches in length, on November 28, 1969. There are so many suspects to this case, but unfortunately, not enough tangible evidence was available to put the real killer behind bars. Now before we get into the details pertaining to the murder I want us to take a step back and understand where Betsy came from and what kind of a person she was Betsy was born on July 11 1947 in Holland Michigan US to Richard and Esther Atsma She was the second of the four children and was raised in a religious and conservative household on West 37th Street Betsy was described as having long reddish brown hair and hazel eyes She was 5 feet 8 inches tall and had a slim figure. Her friends said there never was any shortage of male admirers for her, but she wasn't boy crazy and she never stayed with one person for long. Richard and Esther Azma, Betsy's parents, were graduates of Hope College, a reformed church liberal arts college in Holland. Richard was a sales tax auditor for the Michigan Treasury Department, while Esther was a homemaker and former teacher. Betsy thrived at Holland High School, graduating 5th as a senior. For Betsy, college was a must, and she was a serious student, making sure no boyfriend distracted her from her goal. Betsy's heart was set on her future. In 1965, with one dream to become a doctor, Betsy enrolled in Hope College. She initially wanted to join the University of Michigan. But her family was a Hope College family. Her parents, her older sister Carol, they were all graduates and her brother would eventually go. So she changed her mind and stayed in Hope College. Linda, Betsy's then roommate, recollected her as an intelligent and fascinating individual who exhibited feminist traits. While at Hope College, Betsy came out of her shell and ended up going on several dates. However, no one special crossed her path and she was never in a serious relationship. Among the many suitors that Betsy went out with, there was one man who became angry with Betsy and after a disagreement even pulled out a knife and threatened her life. Betsy immediately ended the relationship and no charges were filed. Betsy said, "Quote, I run into asses every day. This place is not as alive as it should be." and good her words proved that no matter how good hope college was to her family she was not happy with it she was ambitious and her interests could not be fulfilled as long as she was there betsy was interested in the peace corps and she had a drive to help others who were in need one way that she would be able to fulfill her dream of pursuing the peace corps was to transfer to the university of michigan and harper Here the peace corps held a heavy presence. After talking to her parents about it, she transferred. When Betsy arrived at Fall, she decided on changing majors and ended up with English literature. In her senior year, Betsy shared an apartment with three other girls. The apartment above hers was shared by four members of the Alpha Delta Phi fraternity. One of them was David L. Wright, a son of a psychiatrist. 
right a senior was pre-med they had met as juniors but now their friends pushed the relationship by her senior year she was serious about david right she then graduated with honors in the summer of 1969 she had all her plans set in motion to join the peace corps in africa but her boyfriend david wasn't sure if he could wait that long or if their relationship would survive so she decided to give up her dream and follow him to central pennsylvania right later said quote she asked if i would wait for her and so forth and i sort of selfishly said i just don't know what will happen end quote right began classes at the penn state college of medicine in hershey while betsy enrolled in the graduate english program at penn state's main campus in early october 1969 taking the bus to harrisburg on weekends she lived on campus in the atherton hall and shared her room with a student named sharon sharon in one of her interviews said that betsy seldom pursued extracurricular activities and spent most of her free time either studying or traveling to hershey to meet her boyfriend It was Thanksgiving of 1969. Betsy was stressed out because she had fallen behind on her assignment for her English 501 class. That class belonged to Professor Harrison. It was said that his course was really tough and required an awful lot of library work. Now those were not the days of Google. You couldn't just Google out your assignment and take all the information and write it or copy paste it. You had to literally go to the library, take all the information that you can and then write up your assignment. So Betsy did exactly that. The paper was due in less than 2 weeks and Betsy was stressed. She had decided on spending the day prior to it with her boyfriend, his roommates and their girlfriends. She returned the following day with the intention to meet her professors for advice on research paper. David dropped her off at the nearby bus stop in Harrisburg on the afternoon of November 27th. That would be the last time he would ever see her alive. It was said that Wright was planning on proposing her that Christmas. On the afternoon of November 28, 1969, Betsy and her roommate Sharon left their residence to visit the Penn State Patel Library to obtain research material for her English paper and meet their professors. Once they reached, they parted ways. Now, I'm not going to say everyone's surnames because some of the surnames are really hard, so I'm going to use the first names. I hope that's okay. These these surnames, some of these surnames are really hard and I hate mispronouncing anyone's name. So I'll stick to the first name. Betsy spoke to one of her professors, Nicholas, to whom she stated her intentions to visit the Stack Building. Shortly thereafter, she ran into two friends, Linda and Robert, with whom she briefly conversed before entering the library. She then placed her items inside a carrel assigned to her before walking towards a card catalog. Having found the reference she was looking for, Betsy walked down the flight of stairs into the level 2 core stacks at approximately 4:30 p.m. That was the last time anyone would ever see her alive. Assistant supervisor Dean Brongart at 4:30 p.m. said she noticed a girl in red dress standing alone in an aisle with two young men talking quietly among themselves in a nearby aisle a little closer to the west end of the core. 10 minutes later another witness Richard Allen overheard a conversation between a male and a female in the same direction of Betsy when he was using the photocopy machine although he couldn't hear what they were discussing about he told the police later on that it didn't sound like an argument a few minutes later Allen mentioned hearing a metallic crushing noise before a young man whom he described as quote looking like a student end quote ran past him Betsy was stabbed with a one-sided knife to her left breast at some point between 4:45 to 4:55 p.m. At the time of the stabbing Betsy was standing in the aisle between rows 50 and 51 in a dimly lit stack building which made it even harder This wound severed her pulmonary artery and pierced the right ventricle of her heart 
Following the stabbing, Betsy slumped on the floor, not before pulling down a few books with her. Also, if you see the photos, you will see that the library is not very spacious. Author Derek Sherwood wrote in his book, Who Killed Betsy, that, quote, To understand the design and layout of the pate core stacks, it is important to understand that the stacks were never intended to be accessed by students. End quote. In simpler terms, when a student had the reference call number of the book they needed, they simply gave that to the library employee who would then go get the book and then hand it over to the student. That was how it worked. So that way, the library was set in such a way that students were not allowed to go there. Only one person could be there in between the book aisles at one time. But later on this was changed and when Betsy went, she was allowed to go and get her book for herself. The library was not intended for that, but Betsy was allowed to go and do it because later on the students became so many that they decided to let the students go and take it for themselves. In 1969, the stacks were opened for all students and they were given the permission to move around freely and select their own materials. There were two students at the library at that time, Joe Unafida and Marley Edley. Joe was at the university studying geography at that time and was working on a research paper. At short distance from him was Marley, who had earlier bumped into Betsy. The sudden crash caught the attention of Unafida and Erdley. They saw a man rushing towards them. Erdley stood up as the man came close. The man told him, quote, That girl needs help, end quote. The man said and pointed at the direction where the sound came from and quickly left. Early described this man as being dressed in khaki washable slacks, a tie and a sports jacket. He had well-kept brown hair, was approximately 6 feet in height, about 185 pounds and may have been wearing glasses. This individual led Unafida and Early into the core where Betsy lay between scattered books and metal shelves which had been knocked loose. As Early began to check the sign of a pulse, Unafida saw that this individual was leaving the library. He discreetly followed the man upstairs, where he ran out of the library before Unafida could catch him. The man was last seen running in the direction of the recreation hall. Subsequent police appeals for the man or men who spoke these words to Unafida and Early before fleeing the library came forward but they were unsuccessful and the individual was never identified. Erdley was quickly joined by other bystanders including a librarian as she attempted to render first aid while Unafida decided to go and catch this person who had just come and told that something was wrong. A call was placed to the campus hospital at 5.01 pm. The responders were initially informed that a girl had fainted at the university library. Upon receipt of this information, two student paramedics were dispatched to the scene. They arrived minutes later and Betsy was quickly placed on a gurney and removed from the library via a service elevator to be taken to the health center as the paramedics continued to perform CPR on her. Everyone assumed that she was having a seizure. No one knew that she was stabbed. Betsy was not bleeding heavily and her red dress did a good job of hiding the stab wound which made it even more difficult for the library staff or paramedics to understand that she was stabbed. Her dress was made of a thick stretchy material which meant the tear was not immediately obvious. But by the time the tear was noticed it was too late and Betsy was pronounced dead by a physician at 5.19 pm. Betsy's autopsy was conducted by Dr. Thomas at Belfonte Hospital at 11 p.m. on November 28, concluding at 4 a.m. the following morning. The doctor concluded that Betsy was killed by a single stab wound which had penetrated her breastbone, piercing her heart and severing her pulmonary artery, causing extensive hemorrhage into her chest. Death had occurred within five minutes and Betsy would have been unable to scream for help. This is because she was drowning in her own blood. 
This also proves that even if the tear was noticed earlier, no one could have been able to save her from her death. There was also no sign of sexual assault. And the way that she was stabbed, it seemed like this person knew exactly what he or she was doing. I'm assuming it's a he here. So the way that she was stabbed, it proved that the killer was facing her and knew exactly where to stab in order to kill her within minutes. The doctor said, quote, There was nothing that suggested a struggle of any kind. End quote. The doctor also believed that whoever this killer was knew exactly where to plunge the knife in order to do the job in one strike. When Betsy was stabbed, the impact caused her lungs to fill with blood, which in turn left her helpless and unable to call out to anyone. The police sent back an officer to secure the crime scene, but by the time he arrived, the crime scene was completely cleaned up, books were neatly stacked, the floor was clean. It looked like nothing had ever happened. When Betsy was stabbed, she had urinated on the spot, mostly out of fear. The library staff had assumed that she was having a seizure, so once she was taken to the hospital, they immediately cleaned the urine-soaked floor, wiping out any form of evidence left at the spot. However, luckily, the first trooper who visited the crime scene, Mike Simmers, recovered some fresh droplets of blood from the staircase leading into the level 3 core stacks, which indicated that the murderer left the library through that route. The blood was traced back to Betsy. Now one thing to be noted here is that at the time of Betsy's murder, Penn State had a security force including campus patrol that hired mainly students, but not trained police force. It was not that they had trained police force, they had students who were patrolling, so their security was not that strong. In 1969, the state police barracks serving Penn State was on the grounds of Rockview State Prison which is a 15-minute drive from the state college. Also because it was Thanksgiving, several troopers at the barracks, including Sergeant George Kibler, the head of the Criminal Investigation Unit, had taken leave for Thanksgiving, which would start the following Monday. Pennsylvania State Police assigned approximately 35 troopers to investigate the murder. These state police were assigned usage of the Bok building as a temporary command center where they conducted hundreds of inquiries. They interviewed teachers, students and any potential witnesses. And because the murder weapon was nowhere to be found, a $25,000 reward was put on anyone who could give any form of information or if they could find the murder weapon thrown somewhere. Unfortunately, the reward period expired and no one came forward. Initially, it was said that almost 400 individuals would typically enter or exit the library on any given day between 4.30 and 5.30 p.m. And because it was a holiday, the number of personnel were reduced to 90, which made it easy for the police to check and ask questions. But unfortunately, even with this, it led to a dead end. With the help of the two individuals, Unafida and Erdli, a composite sketch of the perpetrator was prepared and released to the media. Troopers Mike Much and Ron Tiger were sent to Holland and Ann Arbor in Michigan in a futile search for a motive, something in Betsy's past. Maybe something happened to Betsy in the past. Maybe there was a person in her past who could have committed this murder. Tiger said, quote, We did not discover or find anything that would give rise to a reason, a motive. There was absolutely no motive at all to this situation. End quote. They went through her letters and even spoke to her friends and family hoping for some information. Even the people at Hope College and University of Michigan were interviewed, but everything pointed towards a dead end. Betsy was a really good girl and she didn't seem to have any enemies. Tiger said, quote, She was so damn squeaky clean, it was pathetic. End quote. Now, around the same time, there were a few other murders going on, and the police were conflicted if this was the work of a serial killer. The killers that were active during that time were Ted Bundy, the Zodiac Killer, the Alphabet Killer, and many more. So they thought that maybe a serial killer did this. But after some investigation, the police dropped that theory too. 
but even with extensive search they couldn't link her to any other victims there are several factors in this case that point out to betsy knowing and trusting her killer because there was no struggle no scream she didn't say there were no raised voices i mean they were in the library with so many other students almost 90 students there were no raised voices because you know when you are in the library and you make a slight noise and the librarian comes and tries to hush you down so there was nothing like that which meant that betsy knew her killer very well and she was really close to this person and not someone that she hated or was trying to run away from the first person on the police's suspect list was her own boyfriend david wright but david had a strong alibi as he was studying with several people and he was immediately crossed off the list david explained quote i always wondered if she stayed down that weekend what would have happened end quote since the murder he has always regretfully wondered what kind of a life they would have had together he was about to marry her he was about to ask her to marry him despite several attempts by the pennsylvania state police and the president of the university eric walker who had conducted his own private investigation into atma's murder the case gradually became a cold case and to this day remains unsolved on 3rd december 1969 betsy was laid to rest her funeral was held at the trinity reformed church in holland michigan david wright was so devastated that he could not get himself to attend the funeral but he later came and laid a rose at her grave unfortunately even with everything that's done this case could not be solved and it's really sad to think that such a young girl lost her life and for what with the latest technology people hope that betsy atma's killer could be found there have been a lot of cases where the killer was found years later especially with dna technology which was not that popular or at that time which was not used a lot at that time so there is a chance that you know betsy's killer could still be caught so here i'm going to list out some of the other suspects in this case and why they were considered as suspects the first one is richard hefner after david's name was cleared the next main suspect on the list was richard hefner richard attended penn state at the same time that betsy did and he even dated her for a short time they lived in the same campus residence and he was said to have hot temper and acted violently towards women It was much later on that he was investigated for pedophilia. The most believable theory comes from two authors who say that Richard is the one behind this whole thing. Richard's story goes something like this. Betsy befriended him and they even went on some dates. But once she started to get serious with David, she immediately broke it off with Richard. It was even said that she told her family that she found Richard frightening. It is said that Richard was so angry when Betsy finally broke up with him that he even threatened to kill her. When the police interviewed him, he was well prepared with all the answers, like he had memorized everything. He knew exactly what to tell them. He even told them that he was at dinner at the exact time of murder. It was years later that one of his professors came forward and gave a statement saying that Richard had arrived that night and asked if he had heard of the murder. He even added that Richard showed signs of excitement. But even with that Richard had always been a primary person of interest in this case. Officials believed that there was a little resemblance between Richard and the unidentified man that was seen fleeing the crime scene. Remember the two witnesses who came and said that they saw a man. So they said that Richard looked a lot like this man. Also Richard's past relationship with Betsy and his violent tendencies pointed suspicion his way. However, due to lack of incriminating evidence, especially with the crime scene wiped clean, the police could never arrest him. I wish they hadn't cleaned out the crime scene. In 2002, Richard was hospitalized for having a hole in his chest. One night he went to use the bathroom and slipped. He passed away the same night due to blood filling his chest. He died the exact same way that Betsy did. 
one point to be noted here is that while the police were trying to get some information out of students there were hardly few who came forward this is because there was great mistrust between the police and the students during that period marijuana smokers increased at that time and police arresting them did not create a strong bond between the students and them and this deeply hurt the investigation so even if a student knew something that person never actually came forward and said anything out of fear that the police might arrest them for something they did or didn't do the same thing happened with lauren wright he was a great geologist but he failed legal and moral test by remaining silent for several years it was believed that hefner may have had something on him and he couldn't risk his career going down the drain Hefner should have done something pretty big for him to stay silent all these years and not even go forward when a $25,000 reward was, you know, announced. So it has to be something big. I mean, $25,000 back then is huge. It's huge today and back then it's really huge. So if he didn't go to collect that $25,000, it means he has done something seriously bad and Hefner knew it. In 2009, a nephew of Hefner's contacted Sherwood and said that on one occasion in 1975 he had heard a heated conversation between Hefner and his mother Iri who had been aware of several accusations relating to pedophilia against Hefner in a conversation that took place shortly after Hefner had been arrested and charged with molesting two neighborhood boys his mother had expressed concern as to whether the police suspecting him of having killed the girl was true or not The next suspect is William Spencer. A 40-year-old sculptor, Spencer had relocated to Pennsylvania from Boston with his second wife shortly before Betsy was murdered. He got the job to teach sculpting in a local college as his wife studied her PhD. Spencer was added into the police suspect list after he allegedly confessed to have killed that girl in the library. End quote. At a Christmas 1969 gathering of faculty members. After these claims a formal questioning began in early 1970 According to Spencer he and Betsy had been acquainted and she agreed to pose nude for his sculpting classes to earn extra money He was present in the level 2 course tax at the time of her murder and had even seen her murderer whom he insisted was wearing an overcoat He offered to construct a sculpture of the individual he had seen and he even later did it for the task force the police quickly dismissed his claims as he and his wife had relocated to pennsylvania just weeks prior to betsy's murder which meant that they didn't have enough time to get to know each other that well for him to know her then get mad at her and then kill her also the way betsy was described she didn't seem like the person who would do something like this i mean pose nude i don't think that betsy would be something like this Betsy would do something like this. Also most of the students from Spencer's class traveled to the university and were not from the university. Larry Morer. Larry Morer was one of Betsy's classmates. Morer was known to have become quite friendly with Betsy in the weeks before her death. Some even saw them going out for a coffee. No ill feeling was known to have existed between the two and Morer was cleared as a potential suspect although it is unknown if he actually passed or failed a polygraph test Morer had blonde hair and was of average height and did not wear glasses this marked his physical appearance to be different from what the eyewitnesses had said now there are a lot of theories to what may have happened to Betsy other than this some say that it could have been a serial killer maybe the alphabet killer Other theories investigated have included the possibility that Betsy may have stumbled upon a homosexual encounter and had been murdered to ensure her silence. This is because a few aisles from where she was murdered in a section of the core used to store desks and spare shelving, investigators observed a desk with a seat pulled backwards. On the desk was a half empty can of soda and a small stack of pornographic magazines, both heterosexual and homosexual. with trace amounts of semen now you have to remember that that time was completely different from today they were looked as taboo so there is a chance that betsy ran into someone she saw something she shouldn't have seen and this was the best way to keep her quiet 
was to kill her because the situation was that bad back then in short everything that police did it led to a dead end many said that she was wearing her sunday best dress but why was she so dressed up why was she wearing this beautiful red dress if she just had to go to the library to get a few books that didn't make sense i tried searching a lot but i couldn't find any information on that was she planning to go somewhere was she planning to hang out with her friends was she planning to see her boyfriend later on no one ever said anything so maybe she just wanted to you know get dressed up well and go to the library that one thing is something that i couldn't find a lot of information on so here we come to the end of betsy arzma's case it's a really sad story it's one of the first stories that i ever came across i thought that this is due time because i was trying to find some information i wanted to know a little more i couldn't find a lot of information on her because almost everything seems too clean the crime scene was wiped clean there was nothing in betsy's past there were no people threatening her there was nothing so bad happening to her she had an amazing life she was in love with a guy he was about to propose she had amazing parents there was nothing bad going to her and suddenly all of this happened do you have any theories on what may have happened to betsy could she have seen something that she shouldn't have seen did she know something because her life seems squeaky clean everything looks good she had a beautiful life what do you guys think let me know in the comments what do you guys think have a great day stay safe and see you next week bye that's it for the day thank you so much for being here don't forget to follow me on social media especially instagram The links are in my description box. You can also find the episode show notes on my website 3amfear.com. If you love reading thrillers, you can now check out my free ebook available on my website. Once again, thank you so much for being here today and see you next week. Have a great week and stay safe out there.